Hi, I'm Angela Boswell, and although it appears that I'm merely a visitor from Arkansas, I actually grew up in Houston um, and went to Rice, but I am glad to be visiting Houston again. I teach at Henderson State University in Arkansas. Um, I know that we are running very behind, and I will, well, just talk very fast. No, <laughs> um, I know I'm standing between you and your break, so I will be very cognizant of that fact. Um, I am researching women, generally speaking, and I am not a visual person, so most of the images that you see today are not really particularly uh, historically important to Houston. They're more to set the mood. After the election of Abraham Lincoln and the secession of South Carolina, Texas men clamored for the right to, get, right to boast that Texas got out of the Union before Lincoln got into power. Texas secessionists knew from the outset that they would need to earn broad-based support for secession in any conflict that followed, and women's support was one crucial means of gaining that. Thus, they encouraged women throughout the state and in Houston to expressly show their support for the defiant actions of their men. Women did so by dress adornments known as the secessionist bow. And when, secession delegate, when convention delegates finally met in Austin to vote for secession, numerous women were there observing from the galleries. After secession and after war began, Women often lamented that they could not do more because their gender prevented them from going to war. However, even though women could not volunteer for the army themselves, they could encourage the men of the community to do so. As Frank Leslie's Illustrated magazine would sarcastically depict later in the war, it was the sacred duty of women to happily encourage their men to go off to war. One of the very important ways that women actualized this support and encouraged enlistment was by the participation in send-off ceremonies. Groups or individuals, groups or individuals, uh, individual women sewed flags for a departing company, and at a send-off celebration, a young, beautiful woman was chosen to make the presentation of the flag. In most cases, however, the women did not speak, as was the case at the presentation to the gentry volunteers. A respected male figure spoke for the women and addressed the company at length, saying, I am here to present on behalf of this, your fair countrywoman and her sister, this beautiful flag, and to express the approbation of the women of Houston, of the manly response which you have given to the call made by your state which would have been interesting coming from a man's voice, but. If family and community celebrations of volunteers were not enough, women could exert other forms of pressure, such as shame. An editorial in the nearby Colorado County newspaper suggested that all the young men that won't go to the wars ought to put on hoops and long gowns. Although there's no proof that the women of Houston did so, the Houston newspaper happily reprinted stories about groups of young ladies elsewhere who would deliver hoop skirts directly to healthy young men who had refused to volunteer. Continuing a tradition begun before the war of having entertainments and suppers to raise money for those very few churches and charities that Dr. Weller mentioned earlier, uh, Houston women probably outdid most other Texas women in organizing such events during the war. Musical evenings and concerts such as the Grand Parlor Entertainment were elaborate gatherings that gave Houstonians an opportunity to show their support for the war, an excuse to have a party, even in the midst of the conflict, and of course, a way to raise money to support soldiers. <laughs> Another very effective tool for raising money was the presentation of a tableau or a living picture. Women to dress to portray a story, usually the patriotic cause in some way. And although the women moved on stage, there were few, if any, dramatic lines. There is a recurring theme here. Women should be seen in support of the war, but not heard. The editors of the Houston newspaper encouraged these events by advertising them, reporting upon them, and even encouraging competition, as in this April 29th, 1863 note about the women of Austin County raising over $10,000 
It called, get up another ladies of Houston and Galveston, they entreated, and see whether you can do any better. The ladies did get up and do better. In fact, nearly a month after the firing on Fort Sumter, women in Houston gathered to form a ladies association with a view to making clothes, tents, and such articles as may be necessary for the use and comfort of Texians volunteering in the present war. Judging by the thanks sent to the ladies of Houston from commanders in the region and beyond, the Ladies Association was very active, although just a year later the association required reorganization and recommitment. Clothing remained the foremost need of the soldiers as reports came in about the discomfort of winter in camps that had mar much harsher winters than Houston, which was, of course, practically anywhere. <sighs> Pleas for, pleas for clothing and especially socks poured in continuously, far outstripping what the Ladies Association could accomplish, especially due to the shortage of materials to make the articles. The ladies had envisioned sewing clothes and knitting socks, but soon they were being called upon to actually make the cloth and to sew and spin the yarn to knit. Throughout the state, by the end of 1862, homespun had become a patriotic badge and a pure necessity as manufactured cloth and thread became ever more scarce due to the blockade and other reasons. Women went to the attics and brought out the looms and spinning wheels they had often not used for a generation. Older enslaved women, particularly, were called upon to teach forgotten home production skills to other women, both black and white. Home production, however, would prove to be insufficient in keeping up with private, much less public, needs for cloth during the war. Cotton and wool were both plentiful in Texas, but the price of cotton particularly soared during the war. Most significantly, however, Texas suffered from a lack of cotton and wool cards. Cards or combs were the handheld wooden brushes with metal teeth used to comb the cotton threads before spinning. But as you can see here, most of them were manufactured beyond the South. And during the war, they could not import as many as they had before. Without the cards, um, they had difficulty spinning, uh, getting the thread to spin. The Telegraph and other newspapers reported constantly on the availability of cards anywhere they could find them, and even instructed readers how to get more out of old cards. Take them to the grindstone, hold the card candle up, teeth to the stone, press lightly, and turn a few times to the card. I'm sure that helped a lot. <laughs> Without the ability to comb the cotton, women could not make the thread and the cloth that they needed. One civilian uh, outside of Houston, one civilian did note that the people in this country are complaining mightily, and indeed, some of them are really frightened at the thought of approaching nakedness. Now, Houston didn't get that bad, of course, but the prison at Huntsville was turned into a cloth manufactory. Even so, the cloth made there was reserved for the clothes, tents, and blankets needed by the Army, or distributed at low cost to destitute families' soldiers. Ladies associations, ladies' associations suggested that the cloth be distributed to their organizations, whose purpose was to sew clothing for soldiers. But nothing came of that proposal because not enough cloth was made. Now, the lack of cotton and wool cards contributed to a scarcity of cloth at home and in the camps, driving the prices of clothing very high. The rising cost of socks, in particular, made it difficult for even the army to purchase them. The need grew so desperate that the local office of the Clothing Bureau in Houston offered cards in return for 25 pairs of socks. By the end of 1862, it became clear that the penitentiary and volunteers and ladies' association would not manufacture enough cloth for civilians or soldiers. As a result, clothing depots began to open, and women could earn pay, not just wool cards, for their work manufacturing clothing. Although clothing continued throughout the war to be the scarcest item, the Army's unprecedented demand for supplies coupled with the blockade led to other scarcities. Women in cooking replaced potatoes with sweet potatoes, 
sugar with sorghum and honey, and coffee with brewed sweet potatoes, corn, beans, okra, or other varieties of seeds, none of which made beverages that tasted very good. Even leather by 1863 was scarce in Texas, leading to a shortage of shoes. Now Houston suffered shorter, fewer shortages than elsewhere. According to historian Paul Levengood, unlike almost any other Confederate city, Houston continued to receive smuggled imported goods, transported over land from Mexico through the blockade, and of course all the Galveston goods were transported to Houston. Merchants continued to advertise everything from coffee and sugar to manufactured clothing and even ladies' hats during the war. Yet even though merchandise was more readily available than in the rest of Texas, scarcity and inflation drove up prices so that only the wealthiest Houstonians could buy. The plight of the impoverished in Houston during the war is hard to imagine, and because of the lack of time or literacy, the lower class penned few documents to really help us understand their plight. One letter to the editor of the Telegraph, however, begins to hint at the desperation and frustration um, in response to the Office of Clothing Bureau's offer of wool cards for 25 pairs of socks. A quote unquote soldier's wife wrote that she wishes to know what Captain Wharton will take for the socks after they are knit and what he thinks the cards will be worth after carding wool enough for 25 pairs of socks. By the time a soldier's wife cooks, washes, irons, and patches for five or six children, how many pairs of socks could she make this winter? Her husband is serving his country at $11 per month, and she must decline taking the order. Socks in our little town sell for $5 per pair. She thinks if this war, the most inhuman of all wars, lasts much longer, and our currency is not restored to its original basis, we will all have to explain Father of mercy, deliver us from our friends. So inflation and shortages throughout the South and, Tex and Texas led to the suffering of families, and many women with husbands in the armies could no longer support themselves or their families. Some women throughout the South took matters into their own hands against merchants whom they believed were price gouging. This is the other half of Frank Leslie's illustrated uh, sarcastic view of women in the South, depicting the Richmond bread riots in 1863, the largest revolt by hungry wives and mothers. Of course, we think that Texas was immune to these things, but it wasn't. There was a seizing party of women in Sherman, Texas. In 1864, 125 women and children rode into Sherman with guns, axes, sledgehammers, and clubs to demand the coffee, tea, and sugar that was rumored to be stored there. And so women and children who were suffering are going to affect the soldiers' morale on the battlefield. Now, Houston had more goods than other Texas and southern cities, thus averting riots and looting. The inflation coupled with absent fathers, husbands, and sons led to poverty and desperation of some. By mid-1862, the associations of women in Houston began raising money through fairs, tableau, and sewing, specifically for the families of soldiers. Although soldiers needed clothing to win the war, they also needed to know that their families were not starving. Now, Houston probably had more opportunities for women to find employment to support themselves than most locations in Texas. Some businesses continued to thrive, such as hotels that employed women. As mentioned earlier, local clothing depots opened and paid women for sewing. And other army or government jobs came and went, as in 1862, when the ordnance officer called for women to make cartridges and also assured them that the cartridges would be filled in another room so they would be safe. Now with the disruptions of war, the number of young men filing through Houston on their way to war, the sustained demand for such services, many women, some women, depending on whether or not you believe Dr. Uh, Weller or not, how many more uh, women then went to church, turned to prostitution to make money. In fact, prostitution became such a nuisance, according to a respectable lady who ventured to write to the Houston newspaper, men who thought they were visiting prostitutes were knocking on the wrong doors, asking impertinent questions of honorable women. 
Houston women overall had more economic opportunities and suffered fewer shortages than women in the rest of Texas or perhaps in the South as a whole. But like many, nor like many of their southern sisters, did they have to cope with invasions, battles in their neighborhood, or occupation by Union forces. However, we only know that in hindsight. The women of Houston truly feared the war would come to their doorstep. They read in the newspaper the effects of Union armies on homes in other parts of the South. They read about Texas women taking target practice in case of attack. And of course, they read about the Union ships right off the coast in nearby Galveston. If these things were not enough to keep them up nights worrying, articles encouraging men to enlist in the war often painted the most dreadful scenarios as if they were imminent. An article by a Houston cap company captain calling for more volunteers predicted that if Union forces took Galveston, Houston will fall in 48 hours. When Galveston was invaded, Houston did not fall, but women here witnessed the disruptions to family, home, and economy that could happen. Houston women took in family members and friends escaping from Galveston, making their own homes crowded. They were also called upon to help all other Galvestonians. The newspaper announced, the Houston newspaper announced rather matter-of-factly, 20 women and children came over from Galveston yesterday to Virginia Point with three carloads of furniture. They will be up today by the train and must be provided for. Women in Houston escaped invasion but still suffered from many other worries. In other parts of Texas, the absence of so many men led to fears of slave revolts reported in the Houston newspapers. And as husbands, fathers, and sons left to serve in the armies, women were left behind to take care of household business and sometimes the public business of their husbands in their absences. Although it had not been unusual during the antebellum era for a woman to temporarily take care of a household in a husband's absence, the Civil War was very different because so many men were away for so very long. Women conducted public and private businesses, transactions in the names and behalf of their husbands, even without the proper legal documents and permissions to do so. Thrust into these new legal and financial positions, women had to rely primarily on the male to get advice from their husbands. Advice that came frequently at the beginning and more sporadically as time and distance made him less aware and her more of the aware of the state of the family finances. The more important role of letters, however, was to maintain the bonds of familial affection between the men at home, men at war, and women at home. This was often difficult. Men's even shortest notes, however, often uh, always expressed their desire to be home. Philip Tucker wrote to his wife, keep up your spirits, my dollar, darling. Do not punish yourself and indulge in the blues. I will be with you again as soon as is possible. I wish I could be at home all the time. And of course, daguerreotypes were one of the popular ways that they could actually keep pictures of their families with them even on the battlefields. Now wives ex just as often expressed the sentiments that they wish their husbands were home. Molly R League wrote, oh my darling, when will this war end so we may all return to our comfortable homes and enjoy them? May God spare you, my precious, from all harm. Write me good letters and let me hear often if it is only a few lines. Above all else, as does this letter, women's letters, whether to husbands or family mem other family members, expressed fear for their safety. The war would take at least 250,000 Confederate soldiers' lives, many of them Texas. And as battles raged in faraway places, women waited anxiously for letters indicating their loved ones were still alive and for casualty reports from battles. Now, most of what we know about Houston women comes from the words of elite women and men who were literate and thus had time to write uh, money, uh, had time and money to write letters. We only get sketchy women, uh, sketchy information about what life was like for women from lower strata of society. Although we do know there were some job opportunities in Houston. We know the least, of course, about enslaved women in Houston. There, is another, there was another talk today on slavery, but I just want to make a couple of brief points about Houston slave women in particular. First, there were many in Houston, and they remained enslaved throughout the war. 
Second, enslaved women also face separations from loved ones and fear for their safety. As enslaved men accompanied their masters to the battlefronts, others were impressed into manual labor by the Confederate government. Others were sold or leased away from their families, and others were separated by the courts at the probating of master's estates. Third, enslaved women worked harder than ever before during the Civil War. As fewer enslaved men in Houston left more work for women to do, and home spinning and weaving was added to their workload. The Civil War affected women in Houston in profound ways. Most white women participated in secession and war as if not vocal, at least visible supporters. They continued homes and businesses and supported their male relatives as they went off to fight for their new country's rights. The difficulties of war strained their support to the very limits, and at the end, women were relieved it was over, even if they were very bitter about the outcome. The war did not fundamentally reshape white women's attitudes about themselves, their abilities, and their place in society. African-American women in Houston, most of whom had been slaves, did see their lives fundamentally altered, but due to freedom and emancipation, not a major shift in gender roles. New gender and racial roles of women would be left to sort out in the decades to come.